Um, welcome one and all for an SPF lecture with Professor Seema Jayachandran. Um, we are a student organization at Yale with a mission to offer undergraduates an avenue to engage with the many facets of international development and welfare maximizing policy formation. I would like to thank the Yale Economic Growth Center for their generous support, without which this event would not have been possible. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Seema Jayachandran. Professor Jay Chandran is a leading development economist and professor of public affairs and economics at Princeton University. She serves on the board of the directors of the Abdul Latif, Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab and heads j gender sector. She's also co-director of the National Bureau of Economic Research's program in development economics and serves on CARE's board of directors. Her work addresses structural barriers to women's participation in the workforce, environmental issues, and gender differences in the economy. Some members of our audience will be familiar with her work from their classes. Professor Jay Chandran's research and ideas serve as a required reading for anyone interested in gender and environmental issues in developing economies, and her work on the interaction between norms and economics is of particular note. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Jay Chandran. Thanks very much, Bilal. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the environmental side of, of my uh, research. So let me just share my screen here. And um, specifically, I'm going to talk about some work of mine uh, that's on paying people to protect the environment. And let me go ahead and get started. And, uh, you know, we I think it goes without saying that there are cases where policymakers want, are trying to protect the environment and people are acting in their own personal interests and that's causing environmental degradation. And so that externality requires some sort of policy intervention. And the economic intuition for what you need to do is you need to make the private cost of environmental degradation high enough that people no longer participate in it. You know, there are the possible approaches, you know, one, you could have regulation. You could just say you can't engage in that uh, environmentally da damaging activity, you know, or uh, you can literally change the price by having a tax and saying, you know, we're going to make that you're allowed to do it, but it's going to be costlier because there's a tax on it. So the problem when we think about trying to address environmental problems in developing countries is that if the person who's polluting is very poor, then banning them from engaging in that activity, like clearing the forest they own that from which they were generating income, or you know taxing them for that activity, that's going to hurt them economically. And so you're yes, you've helped the environment, but you by doing so you have further impoverished someone who's poor. And so the, you know, the quite obvious way around that is to say, okay, can we still kind of use prices, but instead of having a stick, we make it a carrot. So instead of having a tax, we provide people with some upside, some reward for conservation. And in the uh, environmental world, this is called payments for ecosystem services. So you're getting a payment and it's in exchange for some service to humanity that's improving the ecosystem or the environment. And, you know, what's key here is it's, uh, or, you know, a key tenet of this is that it's voluntary. So if someone says, okay, you're offering a reward, but that's less than what I can make by doing the environmentally harmful thing, they could go ahead and still do the environmentally harmful thing. So, you know, you don't need to participate. And that means that no one should be made worse off financially. They're still doing whatever uh, maximizes their own welfare, you've just sort of changed the price by making the environment, environmental option more attractive and, and with the hope that some people will take that up. And so, you know, to be clear, the goal here isn't to use this as a, to reduce poverty, but rather to protect the environment without exacerbating poverty. And so this idea of PES is uh, a big deal globally. So there are you know, $40 billion a year that are given out in PES payments, some of those are in rich countries like the US and Europe, uh, but a lot of those them are in developing countries. And the, the primary use is for forest conservation. And so part of the reason they're commonly used in developing countries is a lot, most of the world's deforestation is now uh, happening in developing countries. And then second, for the reason I just said that, you know, you, in some cases you could just ban deforestation, but when people are poor, you, this idea of PES is attractive. You can ignore the colors and the shapes. This is just to say that there's a lot of PES, you know, especially in Latin America, increasingly in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not going to talk about China, but China runs one of the largest uh, national programs of PES. And so what I'm going to do is sort of talk briefly about three projects I've done on PES. 
payments for ecosystem services, starting with the first project I did, which is on uh, deforestation in Uganda, and then talk about two newer projects that in many ways are sort of exploring issues that arose or kind of you know, questions that that first study wasn't able to answer. And those are on deforestation in Mexico, where we just have a, a small pilot that we've done, and then uh, a project on agricultural burning in India. So let me just jump in and talk about the results from the study in Uganda. So first, let me just remind you, you know, why is, why do we want to reduce deforestation? There are lots of reasons, you know, they have, uh, there's, they are um, creating biodiversity or enabling uh, bio biodiversity to be sustained. But a big reason is carbon. You know, we all learned in school that plants, including trees, are absorbing carbon dioxide. And so if you clear a forest, the, you know, you're, it's not just that there those trees are no longer absorbing carbon dioxide. The really big deal is that those trees are made up of carbon atoms primarily. And so if you cut a tree and it, you burn it or it degrades, like all of that carbon is going up into the, that atmosphere. And because that carbon, that huge stock of carbon is going up quite immediately, uh, averting deforestation often has like bigger impacts on climate change than planting trees today, you know, and because those will absorb carbon dioxide, but, you know, kind of gradually over years. And so if you think about time discounting, you know, the CO2 that we emit as a big spike today is particularly bad with deforestation. Okay, so you know why when when folks think about like what are the all the options to reduce climate uh, carbon emissions worldwide, you know, avoiding deforestation in low income countries often comes up as like this one this should be the cheapest option at a conceptual level. And the reason that's the case is that most of the time people are deforesting. It's for some economic reasons, but those economic benefits they're getting are really small in global terms. So they're super important for those families. That's why we don't want to ban it. But if we just think, you know, like convert it to US dollars, it's low. And if we think we, we're okay, you know, the same benefits accrue if we avert a, a ton of CO2 in the US or Uganda, if we, could, if we can do it more cheaply in Uganda, we want to do that. And so people are clearing their forests either because they want to use the land. And in this context, we worked in, in Uganda, it was for subsistence agriculture, or they were cutting the trees to sell them, you know, sometimes for two by fours, but often it's to make charcoal. So with urbanization, a lot of people are using charcoal for heating and cooking. And so that's coming from trees. And so someone might you know, be cutting, clearing some forests and making $50, $100 for their family, super crucial. But, but as will, you know, kind of become obvious by the end of this discussion, you know, like that, that $100 for them, you know, if we kept those trees intact, that value of that carbon sequestration might be 20 times as high as that. And so that's why it doesn't make sense if we think globally uh, for these trees to be cut down for these purposes of um, you know, making charcoal or growing a little bit more cassava. Okay, so that all makes sense and you know should say why this we should be pursuing this. There's a reason why this isn't so simple or might not actually be cost effective in practice. Uh, and that's because of inframarginal payments. And so, you know, that's uh, economics jargon, and it's going to come up a few times in this talk. And so, you know, the idea of an inframarginal payment is we're making a payment to someone, you know, you know, if they do something good, like keep their forest intact. And the reason we do that is we're hoping that those payments are changing their behavior. You know, they're switching from cutting their forest to conserving. But what we reward people for is the activity. Did they preserve their forest? Not, you know, would they have been cutting it anyway? We don't, we can't see that. We can't observe that. And so when we reward people for an outcome, like keeping their forest intact, many people who sign up and meet that requirement, they would have kept their forest intact anyway, even without the program. And so they met the requirements, they get paid, but their payments weren't actually creating additional conservation. So we can't just look at the payments and how many people complied and say, great, we created all this forest. We really need to think about the counterfactual of how many, how much would have been conserved anyway. And you know, even though this is a really big environmental problem, it's not that people are cutting all of their trees every year, you know, like we wouldn't have any forests if that were the case. You know, a high rate of deforestation means 5% a year or 3% a year or 10% of a year. That still should be really scary. It means in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, there'll be no forest left. 
But what that also means is that, you know, 90% of it was going to be kept intact anyway. Okay, so we did the study in uh, Western Uganda as a randomized trial. You probably are all kind of well aware that this tool of using randomized trials has really taken off in development economics as a way to understand that counterfactual, what would have happened without PES. And so we did a randomized trial in 121 villages where 60 of them were randomly chosen to be uh, have this program and the other 61 are the comparison group. And so this is interdisciplinary research with you know a team where uh, Eric Lanban is a geographer at Stanford. So he led the remote sensing measure because our main outcome is going to be using satellite imagery and calculating how much tree cover there is in different villages. So the program, I'll just say a little bit about it. It ran for two years from 2011 to 2013. You know, in principle, you would want to run these programs forever that in the sense that it's not that we think we can run for a few years and then we sort of get people to care about the environment. Rather, every year we say, you know, they, they could have made some money by clearing some more forest, but the value of avoiding that, there's some flow benefit each year for keeping carbon sequestered and that flow benefit exceeds, you know, annual payments. But just for practical reasons, this was a two-year program. It was run by an NGO called Chimp Trust chimpanzees live in the forests in Western Uganda. So that's another benefit of preserving these forests. So all the households in the village that owned primary forests, they were offered this program in the treatment villages and they were given money and they had to keep all of their forest intact. And if they did, they could earn uh, 70,000 Ugandan shilling, shillings, or at the time that was 28 US dollars per hectare. Uh, and the typical person owned two hectares of forest. And so that means if they complied, they could earn $56 a year. And the way Chimp Trust determined who complied and received payment is they had staff that would go and check for tree stumps, et cetera. So that's how they monitored if you complied and got paid. You know, we as a researcher use satellite imagery where we have measures, not just in the treatment villages, but also in the control villages. We use satellite imagery to, to measure uh, the impacts. Uh, and then a feature, you know, is you had to enroll all of your forest. And, you know, why do you do that is because otherwise people might just shift to their deforestation from, you know, the part that was uh, enrolled to some the part that they hadn't uh, enrolled. So here's just this, the satellite imagery, you know, it's 2.4 meter resolution. So this is just like amazing new data for looking at lots of problems, you know, maybe most importantly, environmental ones, but all sorts of development questions. And, you know, you could see with your eye, each tree that's, you know, obviously we didn't count up trees by looking at this huge uh, data set. We use machine learning techniques and convert it to tree cover. This is what Eric Lamban and his, his uh, lab led. And then we have a, uh, you know, a raster or kind of a, for all the study area, we have pixels of whether it was tree or not. We can overlay those village boundaries and we can compare, you know, the change in deforestation in the control villages, the change in deforestation, sorry, the change in forest cover in the control villages, same thing in the treatment villages and compare them and you know, attribute that to the effect of PES being offered in the village. And so here's the main result. You know, the blue top bar is what happened over this two year period in the control villages. And there was a very high rate of deforestation. There was 9.1% of the forest that had been standing, wasn't standing two years later. So, you know, you can play this forward and this means, you know, this is basically 5% a year. So in 20 years, you wouldn't expect any forest to be left. In the treatment villages, there was still deforestation, but it was less than half as much. You know, why wasn't it more? This comes back to it being a voluntary program. You know, not everybody, some people were growing sugarcane or tobacco and they were very lucrative farmers and they continued to, to do that. And, you know, in some ways that's, uh, fine, we want to give people choice and we want the people where it, it sort of makes sense for them to conserve because they're not making that much income when they cut the forest to stop. And people who have some very lucrative use of this land, you know, there's going to probably be some deforestation that's that's going to happen. And we want it to be concentrated among the people who are creating a lot of economic value when they do. And so this decline in of uh, this blue to the green, that's in percent terms, it's equivalent to five and a half uh, hectares of, of tree cover per treatment village. So, uh, you know, that's about 13 acres. And so the last thing we do in that study is we know just from the regression analysis and the satellite imagery, how many hectares of trees were standing because of PES. We can 
think about what does that mean in terms of the CO2 emissions that are delayed. And so in this case, it's not you know, permanently averted because we, you know, even once the payments stop, we might expect people to keep to start resume deforestation. You know, it wasn't a permanent program, but we still at least shifted when people are deforesting. And what we actually find is that basically people pause their deforestation for two years and they never really catch up on that. They go back to the normal rate of deforestation afterwards. You might have expected they had this backlog of trees and they just cut at a faster rate. Uh, so actually, in the published paper, we had a, a benefit cost ratio of 2.4, which is still attractive. We've now gone back and looked at satellite imagery after the program ended and seen that the treatment group isn't deforesting any faster than the control group. And so that means, you know, the benefit cost ratio is actually uh, close to 15. And so, you know, how, what do we what are the inputs into it? There's a lot and I'm not going to go through the details, but you know, we can know the carbon intensity of the forests in Uganda. We know the social cost of carbon, or we use what the US EPA's estimate is of what's the value of permanently averting a ton of CO2. And then we you know, kind of do the math of discounting and say, well, if that's a permanent value, what's the benefit if we push that in the future uh, for two years or delay or permanently averted two years of, of deforestation? Uh, and then uh, we can do the same thing for the cost. We can put them in the same units. And so once we know the benefits of you know, five and a half hectares of forest is 3,000 metric tons. You know, we can, it turns out that we can kind of see what that is uh, in terms of the dollar value of that. We can then compare it to the cost and we get 15. And, you know, this is just extremely high overall. You know, benefits are a lot higher than cost. But if, also, if we compare it to other options to reduce climate change, uh, you know, mitigate climate change, like in the US policies of, um, subsidizing hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles, when people do the same sort of exercise, they often find a cost benefit, a benefit cost ratio below one. You know, maybe the, the EPA's social cost of carbon is too low. And so those we should still be pursuing those policies. But, you know, relatively speaking, like this is, um, is, is, is a bargain um, uh, for mitigating climate change. Okay, so, you know, the next two projects I'm going to talk about we're very much kind of building on this one where, uh, you know, the, the 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 real puzzle is actually, you know, why was that PES program in Uganda so effective? And so coming back to, you know, what did we expect? Before our RCT, the best studies, you know, matched people on observable characteristics. And this person was offered PES and enrolled, and this person was offered PES and didn't enroll, and they see the difference in deforestation. And so that kind of comparison, you might expect, yeah, the people who enrolled have less deforestation, but that's because they weren't going to deforest anyway. It was a real bargain for them. They could sign up for this program and get free money. So you, you know, when you compare people based on observables, you would expect from economic reasoning that there would be a lot of this inframarginality. So a lot of the differences between the people who signed up and didn't wasn't actually additional forest cover and that those previous studies had been overestimating the effects of PES. You know, instead, we in fact see like larger effects of this PES program in Uganda than what people had seen in other uh, contexts, mostly when they were evaluating the national PES programs in Costa Rica and Mexico. Uh, so the first next study I'm going to talk about is like what is really on this why was PES program in Uganda so effective and then the final project I'll talk about is like okay let's you know moving forward how could we have made it even more effective what were some of the reasons we think it might not have uh, you know was it didn't reduce it by by more than the that five percentage points and and what can we do to improve that okay so the next project is is a pilot study. Same idea, PES to reduce deforestation, and this was in Chiapas, Mexico. So I'm going to go through like a little, uh, I guess, framework or math just to kind of explain the the logic here, and it's coming back to something I already mentioned. So you know, under this, this is now what I'm picturing here. Uh, depicting here is a uh, you know one person, one landowner's forest where I've you know kind of taken their parcel of land and put it as a distribution of what would their cost be to conserve that parcel of land. And, you know, the way I've drawn it, I've made it simple, you know, you, like you could draw a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution or whatever, I made a uniform distribution. So, you know, you can think of this as this rectangle is their area of land. And then the first part, 
they're, they actually have a, a cost of minus $90 to, to conser conserve an acre, which really means that they have a benefit of keeping it intact. You know, they want that forest. And then, you know, there's some other, those costs are smaller benefits for conserving the less. And then, you know, this part over here is the part where there's actually a positive cost to conserve it. And so what that means is, you know, forget any policy intervention, just on their own, someone would say, should I conserve this? Yes, it has a benefit to me of conserving it. Should I conserve this? No, I'm paying a cost to conserve it, or, you know, I'm, I can clear this and make money. And so without any intervention, we'd get uh, this conserved and this part cut. You know, and again, most of it is conserved, but 10% deforestation is still a lot. And then just the way I've drawn this map, you know, if I thought about how much would someone need to be paid to conserve this amount, well, this first little bit, they would need epsilon, you know, like a cent. Then as we move up, you know, they need a dollar to conserve this little bit and a dollar per acre for this and, you know, five dollars per acre for this and up this last bit to really conserve that last bit, that last acre, you know, they would want ten dollars. And so on average, it's going to be five dollars per acre to to do to conserve this, but that five dollars might be a lot smaller than the social benefit um, of getting that conserved. And so you want to say, like, okay, how can I get how can I get five dollars, you know, compensate them five dollars per acre so that they conserve this? Okay, and so that's where, you know, exactly what we did in Uganda, we had a PES scheme to encourage this initial conservation. There's no way for within a farmer to know like, okay, this is the part, piece of your forest you were going to conserve anyway, this is the part you would have cut. So let me just pay you for the part you would have cut. Like, you know, we, we don't know that. Uh, policymakers don't know that. And so instead you just say, okay, we're going to offer you a reward if you keep your entire forest intact. So then you don't need to know what part they would have cut and what part was actually the additional uh, conservation. And so in this example, you know, the uh, that last 10%, they needed $5 per acre to conserve. And so that means if I instead saying, I'm going to pay you for, you know, like all of your, I suppose they have 100 acres, you know, and they need $5 per acre to conserve this last 10. So they need $50. If I'm really paying them, you know, for their entire forest, it's like paying someone 50 cents per acre for their entire forest. So if I said to people, I'm going to offer you 50 cents per acre, if you uh, conserve it, this person would enroll. And this part would be in for marginal, like that, they would have conserved it anyway, but this is additional conservation and this is socially beneficial to do. So that's, makes sense. The, I think that one of the big reasons the program in Uganda was more successful than the Costa Rican program or the Mexican program is many PES programs allow people to choose a subset of their forest to enroll. I don't know exactly why, it really doesn't make sense as I think about it as an economist. And I think, you know, either no one really thought through it or, you know, kind of people, I said it was really important that it's voluntary whether you can enroll in PES at all. If you don't want to do it, you can opt out. That's really valuable so that you're doing no harm, so that nobody is worse off. But here, you know, giving choice is not even without choice, even this program in Uganda like has this feature, no one should be made worse off because they should, they could say no. But, you know, in, the, in this case, like the, cho I, I think maybe people think choice is good and without thinking through how detrimental it is. So now imagine I offer this, that program where you can, we're paying you 50 cents per acre and you can choose how much to enroll. Now this person is only going to enroll 90.5 acres, you know, in my, if they had a hundred acres, you know, they're just going to say, let me just enroll the part where my actual cost is less than 50 cents per acre. And so you've now paid $45 and 25 cents if they've complied because it's 90.5 times 50 cents, but only 0.5 acres was actually added forest. So in that previous example, the cost the, the program was paying out per extra acre of forest standing was $5. Here it's ninety dollars and fifty cents. So that's a huge difference. You know, they're like imagine this value of this forest was like fifty dollars per acre. If you know, if the world had it, you know, like there's a lot of scope for PES to to really um, work, at, et cetera. But you can completely get have that unravel with this kind of um, setup. And so we look, did a pilot study in the context of Mexico's. Uh, national PES scheme, which is called PSAR, uh, which has this feature that landowners can 
choose the land to enroll. And so they that program has five-year contracts. They pay a thousand pesos per hectare for conservation. You know, Mexico is a richer place than, than uh, Uganda. And one thing that's useful for our pilot is that the budget has been, you know, it's terrible for the world, but the budget has been slashed. So many people apply, they meet the criteria, but they hit a budget cap, so they're not enrolled. And so with uh, Santiago Esquerda Torta and Santiago Saavedra, we're, we've been doing this pilot in uh, Chiapas, Mexico, in the Selva La Condona era, area near the Guatemalan boundary uh, border, where we enrolled 63 households that had applied to pay SAA. And then in early 2021, they were rejected because of this budget shortage. And what we have is their application. So we know when they applied to pay SAA, like what subset of their forest did they want to enroll in the program? And so we offered a one-year contract, so it wasn't five years, uh, but it was at the same rate of $47 per acre. But we randomly offered some people that standard contract where we, uh, it was the polygon they had submitted in their uh, PSAR application. And the other half, it was a full enrollment contract similar to what we did in Uganda, which is if you want to enroll, you have to enroll all of your forests. So we did a baseline survey and for everybody, we knew their entire land holding. So all of their forest. Okay, and so you know, what do we predict? So we should pre we predict that the full enrollment should have lower compliance. Lower, you know, fewer people are gonna to want to do this. I made my math example so that you know, my, the land holder would accept my uh, 50 cents per acre deal, but you know, it could have been that it was for you know 48% 48 cents and then the person wouldn't have uh accepted so you know we don't know exactly if the amount of 47 is enough to get people to participate when it's a higher bar of having to conserve all of your forest but if they do comply they should be deforesting less because they have to protect not just this subset but all of their forest and so the actually whether this ends up helping is ambiguous because you could have lower compliance but higher uh forest protection, additional forest cover, if you do comply. So here are our results. So we have these 63 people and we half of them got the standard contract, half got full enrollment. And we do see lower compliance, quite a bit lower compliance with the full enrollment. So 94% versus 71%. We set the bar higher, many people uh, you know, didn't meet it. Nonetheless, we see that overall, there's a lower deforestation rate in this group that was offered full enrollment. So if we take people's entire land, uh, so it's like apples and apples for the two groups, their entire land, overall there were 6% deforestation in this one year. So again, a high rate of deforestation, 6% in the standard and 3% in, uh, in the full enrollment contract. And we can break that down. And what do we see? You know, the, it's coming from exactly what we would have predicted. So if we look at the part that the person that wouldn't have wanted to enroll where, you know, they didn't submit it to pay SAA, we see that there's, you know, there's some deforestation in the full enrollment, like not, not everybody complied. Uh, but even though almost everybody complied with their partial enrollment contract, you know, they had this deforestation, higher deforestation in this land they didn't choose to enroll. Whereas if we look at the, you know, the polygon that they submitted, that's there's basically nothing. And so we don't have a control group here, but you know, this is sort of indicative that probably almost all of this payments in the standard contract was just for marginal, you know, paying people for what they would have done uh, anyway. So, you know, another way to see this is to compare these two light bars, you know, people are sort of shifting their deforestation to the part they didn't submit to pay SAO or, you know, said differently, they're saying like, oh, I, was, I wanna deforest this, let me take that out of my application. So, you know, I don't know what we'll do with this. We're sort of trying to get traction with the Mexican government to see if they want to do a full RCT. We have some, you know, aspects of this we want to investigate more. But even if we don't end up doing a follow-on study, I, you know, this is like a nice example where just sort of thinking through the economic logic of contracts and how people will select into contracts and how contracts shape behavior, you know, is really useful for uh, making a difference between, you know, I think at like a high level, someone might say, this is still both are PES, they're very similar, but they have quite different implications for the actual forest cover you gain per dollar spent. Okay, so the last project I'm gonna talk about is uh, 
crop residue burning in India, which I'll explain in a couple of slides. But first, let me sort of say what, you know, where, what were we trying to do with this and how does it relate to kind of the, what we saw in the Uganda study? And there are barriers to complying with PES that you can, if you can alleviate, that can improve the effectiveness of PES. So one thing that we saw in the Uganda study is that when people were deciding whether to sign up and comply, mistrust was one barrier. You know, that mistrust might be people hadn't, weren't comfortable signing contracts, so they didn't know if this was some scam. But, you know, you also might not trust that you're going to get those payments in a year or whenever they're promised. And so if you think like, well, there's a 50% chance these guys are going to, uh, you know, ask me to do this and then not pay me, the actual expected payment is like 0.5 times whatever the nominal payment is. Another barrier is credit constraints. You know, if you are having to forego some income or pay some costs today, and then you're going to get paid after it's been verified that you complied, you might say, that's a great deal, but I need the money now to be able to comply. And so if you don't have access to credit to borrow and you don't have a lot of cash on hand, you might not be able to take up this opportunity because you, you, you just literally don't have the money to do it. And so there's this timing mismatch where, you know, you're sort of paid after complying, but you incur some cost to comply up front. And the reason, you know, you don't move all of the PES money up front is that, you know, it'd be very hard to recoup it afterwards if the person didn't comply. You know, it's like people are poor and imagine an NGO saying, hey, you know, you've already, you spent this money, we gave you money, you spent it on a hospital bill, but like you owe us money. So it's like basically being a debt collector uh, among very poor people. And it's, you know, without a strong legal system and some ethical issues, you know, so in that sense, there's a reason the money is, is usually paid after the fact, um, even though in principle, it could be paid upfront and then recouped if the person doesn't comply. And so with uh, Kelsey Jack, Numbers the Kala, and, and your own Rohini Pandey, we evaluated a PES contract variation that was trying to strike this balance and you know, kind of make PES more effective in environments where there was this kind of mistrust and people had cash constraints. And namely, we paid a portion of the payment upfront and we made it unconditional. So we paid it upfront because we thought that would increase you know, trust in the payment. They they would we we were not some fly by night uh, group, and it gave them the liquidity or cash to pay the cost to comply. We made it unconditional just be, for this practical reason that you know it's just really hard to recoup it afterward. So we said let's just accept that, and we told people you know this part is uh, no, you know we're not going to try to take it back. You can you get this money in no matter what, and we kept the total payment fixed. And so because we made some of it unconditional, we made the conditional part smaller. So the conditional part is like the reward for doing the environmental rewrite thing. And so it's not obvious that this is better because we, yes, we help with mistrust and liquidity, but we made the reward for doing the right thing smaller. Moreover, there's another strike against upfront payments, which is even if they're more effective, like you actually got more people to comply like you've got more additional conservation through this, it might be less cost effective because you're making these unconditional cash transfers to a bunch of people. They go on and still hurt the environment, you know, and that's just money spent, but without any environmental benefit. So the cost of this kind of program, the upfront payments are, are costlier because you're paying them to everyone, regardless of whether they comply. And so, you know, we thought this design tweak is interesting in the context of PES, but it had many much broader applications. You know, they're in developing countries, they're conditional cash transfers and for all sorts of uh, activities like delaying marriage of a daughter, uh, sending kids to school, you know, and, and the same idea of the timing of payments might be relevant there as well. Okay, so crop residue burning in India, let me just give you some very brief context. Uh, you know, it's a huge deal that's mainly coming in the states of Punjab and Haryana, and it has wide reaching, far reaching implications because it's a major source of pollution uh, in New Delhi, where the winds are flowing from these states and that pollution is settling in New Delhi. So, you know, there's like a very striking number that air pollution, specifically particulate matter, is reducing life expectancy in North India by as much as nine years. Like that should be um, shocking if this is the first time you've heard that statistics. It's like a really big deal. Not all of the pollution is from crop burning, but uh, for in the sort of 
false autumn season, you know, about 30% of the pollution in New Delhi is coming from crop residue burning in um, from rice pad, rice fields. And so what is crop residue? It's when you use a mechanical harvester, it leaves, you pull up the rice, the paddy, but you it leaves some straw in the in the ground, and that's the you know crop residue or stubble. And so it's you know sort of ironic that what we think of like this is technological progress, uh, or you know I don't know if ironic, but it's just like a, a you know an unintended consequence of what, what we think of as a, as a productivity enhancement. It is a product, productivity enhancement, but it's led to this practice of burning. You know I think it's it's also an unintended con consequence of other environmental policies. So because there's a depleted groundwater, the government delays when people can plant rice so that it's more monsoon fed rather than tapping groundwater. But that means that there's people use grow two crops a year. And so there's very little time between harvesting your rice and needing to plant your wheat because your rice was planted so late and harvested so late. So you have this crunch period. And so burning is also just like the fastest, cheapest thing to do because of that crunch time. The other, you know, kind of uh, you know, weird, not weird, yeah, I guess weird thing that kind of is in the mix here is that the employment guarantee scheme, social safety net, that's meant that people who had been migrant laborers coming to these villages to help harvest rice, they no longer need to do that because they have an income support in their own village. And so that, that has pushed towards this mechanical harvesting and, and burning. Okay, so we, uh, you know, so burning has high environmental costs, but it uh, it's still the cheapest thing for a farmer to do. So their alternative is to rent crop residue management equipment. And so they're paying 13 to $38 per acre. And so private, privately paying this 13 to $18 doesn't make sense to them. But what makes this a very stark, stark case where it's just welfare improving to get rid of this practice is if we just do a back of the envelope of how many people die because of the air pollution from crop burning, you know, that value of the life lost is something like 600,000 rupees per acre. So, you know, like a factor of 200 to 600 times as high. So, you know, there are many other costs besides mortality. Um, okay. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to go a little bit fast because I didn't plan time too well. So, there are broadly two ways you could deal with the crop residue instead of burning. You could incorporate it into the soil, the in-situ approach, or you could take it off the fields and have uh, and with balers, and that's ex situ. And so the you know this is like a no problem in India, and there are fines. It's illegal to burn crops, but there's very little political incentive to fine constituents to help New Delhi. So those fines are basically those uh, not enforced very much. The government of India also has been giving money to the states to subsidize specifically the in-situ equipment. That hasn't been very successful for two reasons. You know, one is it made it cheaper, but it's still expensive. So the prices I quoted on the previous slide, that's after subsidies. So yes, it's cheaper than it would have been, but farmers are still being asked to make a personal financial sacrifice to you know, help the environment. And also many farmers prefer the ex situ management. And so there are huge welfare gains from eliminating crop residue burning, but the current policies have um, you know, failed. And so we did a study design, we worked with the government of Punjab, we as the J-PAL South Asia team kind of implemented this pilot intervention, but, you know, trying to kind of do something that the government of Punjab was interested in and, you know, thought might be worthy of scaling up. So we worked in 171 villages. We had some control villages. Then we had what we're calling standard PES, where all of the money is after the fact, after we've seen you've complied, and it's um, uh, conditional on complying. And then we have this upfront arms where some of the money is given to you upfront and unconditionally. And I'm mostly going to, you know, compare at this level and not show you the sub arms. So I won't go through kind of what we did. And let me uh, just sort of say our main out or one of our outcomes, we have different outcomes, I'll show you one of them is using satellite imagery, where here we're trying to, you can't look at the smoke, because that's much at a, like, at a, you need a large area to see the smoke. But after a fire, you could see on the, the field, the scar of a of burning your field. Okay, so what do we see? And I should have said that the payment rate was 800 rupees per acre. That we knew that wasn't 
it should have been higher, but this is what the government said they could reasonably think about scaling up at the time. And so, you know, the costs are higher than 800, but not everybody's burning. So someone should be kind of on the margin of shifting their behavior for this. So what do we see? We see 9% of people complied. They, they, we determined that they hadn't burned uh, in the standard PES and 18% in the upfront. So, uh, you know, neither was huge. You need to raise the payment to really make a bigger dent in this, but it's clear that the upfront worked better than the standard. That's in our data on whether people kind of, we had people go check on the ground and for uh, burning as well. And this is using that data. This is now using satellite imagery, so a different uh, data source. And we see a similar pattern where the control group and the standard PES group, there's no difference. You know, even though people had complied with the program, like it wasn't really getting additional people to move away from burning, it was all inframarginal. Whereas the upfront PES is doing better than the, this is not burning, so higher is better. So, you know, like compared to status quo, there are 12% extra people who weren't burning. We have a third way of triangulating that shows the same pattern that in, we did an endline survey by phone during COVID. And we see when we ask people what equipment they rented the previous year, we see that uh, there's a 10 percentage point increase in using a bailer if you had been offered this upfront PES. And so this is telling you that everybody who shifted their behavior because of our, our reward did it using these ex situ uh, approaches. You know, they're cheaper, farmers like them more. And so, you know, this is sort of, it's kind of telling you those subsidies for just the in situ is probably not the right way to go. You know, I told you there are two reasons why upfront might matter. It can build trust and it can give people liquidity. Probably both were relevant. But where we see stronger evidence is that if we compare the farmers in the upfront arm and the standard arm, the ones who are in the upfront PES arm, they reported having more trust that the payment would be made. And this was true even for the people who didn't comply when we asked them, you know, like, hey, when we came around, or, you know, when that team came around and offered you this payment, did you think you would actually get paid? the people who had been given this upfront money uh, had more trust in it. So, you know, we can also go do cost effectiveness here. And we find that upfront is more cost effective, even though you are making payments to all of these folks who then go on to burn, uh, you can, uh, it's about 2,700 to 4,000 rupees per averted acre of burning. And that's equivalent to saving a life for 3,000 to 4,400 Dollars And so, you know, if you look on like GiveWell's website of like, what are the cheapest ways in the world to save a life? Like this is in the ballpark of, of just, um, you know, some of the cheapest ways we know anywhere in the world to, to save lives. Um, you know, should this be scaled up? There are some challenges. I think you could think of some alternatives like paying for bales or paying the village rather than individuals and having the village figure out how to kind of get people at the, the local level to to do it, but you know, I think the you know, where I see this as is like it's a very politically challenging problem within India, and there are you know lots of views on like how can we convince farmers to do this. But you know, I think we showed that you know a lot of this comes down to just a financial calculation for farmers, and if you can make it costlier for farmer farmers to burn than not burn, you know, you can switch their behavior, and you can do that for much much less than the benefits of averting this. So, you know, let me just leave this up as a last slide. You know, the, the paying people to avoid environmental harm can work uh, and it can reduce environmental harm without exacerbating poverty. You need to think hard about the contract design because this problem of inframarginality is important. And, you know, you need to structure contracts realizing that people face market failures like credit constraints. And you need to think about how to make PES work in light of that. You know, in the forest context, it's, it turns out to be like a super cheap way to uh, address climate change. And then even when the environmental benefits are strictly local, you know, just within India, paying for conservation in developing countries can still, you know, if you're a philanthropist, could still deliver large benefits per dollar spent. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Devon, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for that. 
just expansive overview um, of PS and where it works, where it doesn't, and sort of some of the challenges. That was fascinating. We have a couple of questions um, in the chat and that we've received privately. I want to ask the first one that was public posted, which was from Braden Wong, who asked, what role do you see for behavioral economics in shaping policies and interventions for reducing emissions, particularly in developing nations contexts? Yeah, you know, but I guess behavioral economics is, uh, you know, it's a broad term, uh, but, you know, like, I guess sometimes people can make mistakes and when they're trying to, um, you know, kind of think about cost benefits, they have, you know, what economists would call boundary rationality. Sometimes people might have self-control issues. So I think, you know, in any policy, you realize, you know, people aren't, we're offering a contract and as people are thinking about the costs and benefits of a contract, you know, they're, uh, you know, that's like a calculation and nobody is like the perfect homo economicus doing that. So I think in all cases, like whatever we put down as theory, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like always incomplete. And this is, so therefore there's a role for behavioral um, economics. You know, I think what's interesting is sometimes the mistakes people make can make programs more cost-effective, you know? So in some ways, like the surprise is like, why isn't there more, why didn't every, not everybody signed up for the upfront PES contract. Like everybody could have gotten, uh this free money of the unconditional part and but some people like chose not to enroll and there might be some other reasons they chose not to enroll but you know like they might have just made a mistake or maybe it's like a you know they felt guilty you know all these things that economists don't normally incorporate so you know like in that case it actually increased cost effectiveness because the you know the people who thought they weren't were going to keep burning their fields like said oh yeah, i'm not going to take your free money so you know interestingly like sometimes we think of behavioral biases as like we often think of them as like bad and making people worse off. If you think from a like a policymaker's point of view, where you're also trying to think about cost-effective ways to have policies, you know, sometimes behavioral biases can be your friend, um, you know, rather than your foe. And then I think, you know, I guess one aspect of uh, I have like a hobby horse on this one, which is, you know, I think whenever I present this, people and even like even like in policy debates, say in India, of like, you know, how can you get farmers to realize this is just bad for the environment and we need to protect the environment or how can you know like get for people in Uganda to appreciate the environment and I have a pretty strong view that's not the right approach you know that like changing people's I work on gender attitudes I'm all for changing people's gender attitudes but and I'm all for changing people in rich country rich people's attitudes about the environment but you know this is if you get someone to care about climate change you know that you're basically getting them to internalize the welfare of me, you know, and so getting a very poor person to internalize the welfare of me just doesn't make sense given our relative income. You know, I like I think that this shouldn't be a an altruistic thing that you know if, if it's altruism versus income, we shouldn't be trying to get people to be more altruistic at the cost of you know how much food they have to for their their families, etc. So I think in that sense, I'm uh, you know I, I I feel pretty strongly that you know it's often like economic arguments are sort of pitted as you know, like less ethical or markets are bad or, but, you know, here, I think the alternatives of trying to change hearts and minds is, um, you know, less ethical in my view, because it's basically like uh, trying to, you know, kind of hurting people's income, uh, you know, in a, by getting them to internalize the externalities of the rest of the world when the rest of the world is is richer than them. Thank you so very much for that. Very interesting answer. Um, I had an, like a bit of a follow-up question. Uh, we had Professor Jethi Ghosh with us a couple of weeks ago, giving a lecture on sort of climate imperialism and how we can sort of sort of overcome this inequality by having this carbon debt system. Um, and sort of the discussion of PES sort of led me to sort of a similar comparison. Um, is there any way you, you can sort of conceive a carbon debt system that involves PES, where you sort of have countries that have a higher carbon debt sort of paying for and supporting PES schemes in countries where these emissions are lower, but sort of conservation seems to be more of a priority. Yeah, you know, the, so there, I think there are two different pieces of that. So I, you know, this program in Uganda was funded by, you know, the United Nations Environment Program, which in turn is funded by richer countries. And so, you know, under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, like rich countries can meet their own uh, targets by funding projects over, you know, in developing countries or overseas. So you can have this like cross-border trading basically, um, or, you know, kind of 
you get credit if you pay for it and you know run a program it doesn't matter if it's within your borders and that makes like a lot of economic sense if you can you know in the sense of like why should we say we can only do things within our own borders and have to therefore pursue uh, you know, things that are expensive when that same budget could have had a lot more mitigation if it was done elsewhere. So this idea of like rich countries funding projects like PES in Uganda or Mexico or wherever makes a ton of sense. You know, then there's a question of, okay, so, you know, just per capita, like the, you know, richer countries do have a higher NDC today, you know, uh, like target today for mitigation than poorer countries. And so like, you know, there is going to be more opportunities for low cost carbon mitigation in Uganda than the Ugandan government is going to pursue just given their lower target. And then, you know, the, the carbon debt is saying, should we, you know, widen this gap between what Uganda's uh, expectations are in the U.S. to take account for, you know, the U.S. had the benefit of all of this carbon emissions to get to where we are. And, you know, Uganda should have that opportunity. And so, you know, I think, I guess there's, you can think separately of the question of like, should we even in, enlarge the amount that the US and Europe and other rich countries need to cover basically, or, you know, kind of pay for. And, but whether or not that change happens, even today, there are a lot of, it makes a ton of sense for this to happen in low income countries because that's where it's cost effective, uh, but for the money to come from, you know, rich, richer countries. So I want to question, ask a question about something that sort of popped up over the course of the examples you cited, which is government's reliance on PS schemes that tend to yield in for marginal outcomes rather than yielding sort of the positive outcomes that you talk about through upfront payments, through other things. And I'm curious why you think governments continue to implement schemes that only produce in for marginal outcomes. Yeah, I... Uh... You know, I don't know the an answer to that, except that, you know, I, I think the like, amount of rigorous evaluation that is uh, happened is pretty low. You know, I think the most natural way to do this program is to say like, oh, we implemented this big program. Like the first pass would be, we implemented this big program, let's like compare before, after. And, you know, and that you might see results there and you might like believe them, you know, and uh, and then even this matching on observables, I think for most people without kind of training and you know, the reasoning of like self-selection, it makes sense. Like these guys look identical. And, you know, it's only when you start to, I guess, really think like an economist of like, well, why did one person sign up but not another? You know, do they have some private information that they acted on that you realize, you know, you could get things very wrong. And so, um, you know, I think I don't think they saw evaluations of like nothing and said, we still want to pursue it. But, you know, even if they did, like, you know, they're all, this is where you have to be, uh, you know, take it's humbling as you know someone who does impact evaluations that there's just a lot of politics that influences policy making and so you know if you are getting political credit for a program because nobody everybody else thinks it's successful you know it, you might continue it even if you knew it wasn't or uh you know that they're like maybe i don't think this is the case but you know, maybe, you know the, when you have inframarginal payments um you're basically like giving free cash to a bunch of people. And so people are happier, you know, getting free cash than getting cash to have to change their behavior. You know, so Matt, I sort of said that the, we got more re de deforestation reduction in Chiapas when we had people enroll all their land, you know, but like the standard contract, people got paid and didn't have to do anything. That's, you know, like that's attractive. So if you think of uh, like, Inframarginal payments are like pretty close to just a cash drop, you know, for people. And so people like that. So they're, you know, politicians, if, imagine you knew, you knew this was the case, but, you know, people really loved the current system. It would be hard to, to change and, and basically ask more of, of people. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, how much of it is like lack of awareness of the logic that I laid out versus, you know, there just doesn't exist any evidence or showing that strong evidence showing that it's like completely inframarginal uh, or mostly inframarginal and then, you know, versus like knowing it and, and having other factors driving policy decisions. But, you know, I certainly think we, there's, you know, coming back to like why I think producing good evidence is useful. You know, I, I feel like if we write this that Chiapas example up and publish it or put out policy memos, you know, like hopefully we might not change everybody's minds, but, you know, maybe we'll move the needle and 
one of those places that's that's doing that or influence someone who's like starting a new program that this is the smarter way to design it. So I think we have another question um, that I just got from David Pung, who said, thank you for the talk. And was curious about, could you share your thoughts on the role of government institutions in driving behavioral changes and reducing emissions? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely think, I don't know what exactly you mean by government institutions, but, um, you know, I, I, I think climate change and environmental policy is just like a classic example where we need government, you know, like where uh, it's an externality and that's, we need regulation, you know, so I, uh, I, I emphasized PES, but, you know, I think like one of the most important things for developing countries is just like improve regulatory capacity to, um, you know, create that behavior change and, you know, and hopefully you can create norm, norm change as well. But I think a lot of the way countries that have reduced, rich countries that have reduced pollution have gotten there is through strong regulation. So in that sense, I think like a strong state capacity to, to regulate is, you know, like the key to uh, environmental progress in in developing countries. And then, you know, I think there's other aspects of behavior change, you know, that might not just be because like something is taxed or is illegal or what have you that can come about. But yeah, I guess related to my earlier answer, I, I feel like, you know, that's probably not the first thing I would prioritize in um, poor countries. And even in the US, you know, I think kind of getting all of us to you know, people getting more people to become vegetarian or take fewer flights, you know, that's going to have a very small dent in the problem compared to, you know, uh, things governments can do to, you know, short of a carbon tax, but basically to do something, you know, that's sort of simulating a carbon tax in terms of like really changing people's the financial calculus of everybody who's making decisions about carbon emissions. And we've got in one last question, um, which was about sort of each of these examples they said has dealt with rural areas or with farmers, landowners, and they're asking sort of, is this applicable in urban environments, environments where you're dealing with other resources such as water? Um, can PES be applied there or do you think there are different challenges to such schemes? Yeah, you know, I, right. So these are rural areas. And so the, like a lot of, you know, land use is going to be naturally a, a rural area, but you know, you could, I guess you could think about the same logic applying to urban areas. So for example, like there, you know, there are fuel subsidies in many developing countries. And that's like, that's because fuel is placed priced at world prices. So it's a really big part of people's consumption basket. And so for poor people, like that's just really costly if fuel wasn't subsidized. But that's, you know, it's the opposite of a carbon tax. It's like encouraging us to have even more carbon. So I think there are ways to have you know, to kind of, I guess, a, a sim similar idea in an urban setting would be like, let's take away those subsidies, you know, like let's tax fuel, but then let's have some transfers to poor people to offset it, you know, so like kind of thinking the same idea of how can we, you know, I guess the broader principle is here, how can we make the effective price high for doing something that's environmentally damaging? And then think of, uh, you know, kind of a policy that does that in a way that's not exacerbating poverty. And so I think in urban areas, you know, like free electricity or free water or highly subsidized electricity and high, highly subsidized water, are all uh, leading to more environmental degradation. Lifting those are very, uh, you know, kind of anti-poor policy. So that's both, you know, like oh, bad if we are, care about poverty, but it's also politically harmful in many settings so i feel like you know lots of times like free water bills is like a a, a a way to win votes anyway but you know like we can kind of get rid of those but but you know think about how to do it in a way that doesn't exacerbate um uh, that uh, that compensates the poor so that they're net um you know better off or at least not worse off uh, and david asked to follow up just which is probably a good note to end on what countries, people, or organizations have you recently been inspired by in their work on making better or thoughtful policies? Uh, that's a good question. Let me let me think. I uh, I'm not, I'm going to forget the the brand of it, but you know, when you work on deforestation, like I see, I, I or just this area, like I think a lot of carbon offsets 
are silly or not silly, but you know, like they're not, there's no, they don't measure their additionality. So if you go on by an offset market, you know, who knows if that was actually changing it. So I think the organizations I'm really keen on are the ones that are trying to like be rigorous about what their actual additional carbon is, et cetera. So there's a blanking on the name. Burn is a, they make cook stoves in uh, East Africa, you know, in our, uh, and so those are people, are, they're fishing cook stoves where people need less fuel. They actually are great for the person who buys them too, because they uh, have to spend less on fuel. And so they're, you know, that's an organization that's like, has done an RCT with some researchers at UPenn and University of Chicago to like evaluate what happens when you give loans so that poor people can get these cook stoves. And then, you know, they're like trying to get beyond carbon offset markets, but with some, you know, rigorous evidence. And so, you know, I think the part of kind of, solve, I think, yeah. So I, I, I find that inspi inspiring partly because it's, they're the exception, uh, you know, to the rule, which is like carbon offsets that are probably not really offsetting carbon. Well, thank you very much, Professor Jan Jandrin for joining us. Um, this has been really fascinating. And for those of you um, who were able to make it, we appreciate it. And the lecture will be posted online as well. So thank you again. Thank you guys both.